it's it's really nice to be back but the covid ke baad to be back at sept is is wonderful and especially really nice to see lots of young people in the room and colleagues from all is fantastic we need lots of support and help in this sector and across the sectors as as we know it today so what i'm going to do is to try and connect up uh, eventually i'll i'll go from from the global to the local scale because especially uh, with the kind of conversations we're having in the morning we need some fairly fundamental scientific kind of grounding uh, we need to look at the evidence and then we can make a case for some of the questions that we were trying to deal with today so i'm going to run through this very very quickly you will have the slides with you so the idea here is forget about you know trying to take notes and stuff like that there's a narrative here which is based on evidence and then we can have a quick conversation later as you know as, as much time as we have um okay yeah so this is the big context at the current point of time the context is we are bang after covid in the middle of a poly crisis and climate is just one of a set of things and the reason that i've laid that out is you know you have covid when we don't notice it in india because the stock market is doing all kinds of odd things especially in gujarat you don't notice it but we are in the middle of a global recession serious economic challenges and then climate is coming but the real issue for us thank you so much the real issue for us is coming behind that is the biodiversity collapse which is probably the most serious challenge that we have so we are living in a set of at least six interconnected questions the most serious one as far as this country is concerned and most of the countries of the global south are poverty and inequality so when we're talking about climate water etc it's in that context if we can't deliver development then the rest of it is kind of relatively immaterial and one of the reasons that we have a climate problem is because our development model like shira said is not working it's not working here it's not working in most other parts of the world but there are a few other things that we haven't had for a while we are now also in the middle of a serious debt crisis india may not be in that situation you know where sri lanka is at the moment we know that many countries that you're coming from are in that in that context plus because of the conflict we have we have serious intergovernmental fragmentation why am i saying intergovernmental fragmentation because dealing with climate is dealing with the global commons you know the carbon dioxide is coming across the world but it has to be dealt with globally and we don't have a mechanism for dealing with it any of us who've been part of the cop process or the ipcc that i spent many many years with and have negotiated know that this system forget about being broken it doesn't actually exist at the moment so if you don't have a governance system how are you going to deal with these issues so the question of connecting what's happening in your in your toilet in the sanitation system with what's happening otherwise is a tough tough connect to make so that's the big question that's there so this is some people who are asking this question especially the students in the morning we're doing very badly on the global sdg agenda this is the projections from last year's report i kind of we we have produced some of this stuff there from stsn so we're trying to connect sdg 6 and 13 the people who are you know who know this kind of stuff that say the challenge is if you look at the graph on the right uh, there's almost no progress and two thirds of the sdgs were in reversal on about 15% of them some of them are kind of doing well and very often that's because of what china has done fine the urbanization of china has done it so we're doing badly on the 2030 agenda some of us are part of this con conversation i suspect that by the end of the year we will actually reset 2030 to somewhere further up it may be 40 or 50 uh we know from the progress that we're making in this part of the world that many things are working but they're not working fast enough it's not good enough for things to work they have to work at scale the the, the things that i've highlighted below that are quite important in, in especially in the context of the conversation that we're having so the gross world output this year is about you know 100 trillion dollars or so it's growing at about 2.5% a year in fact the new imf projections are almost at 3 because of various things that are happening but the real issue uh on the infrastructure side is our loss levels this comes from the global infrastructure resilience report which i helped co-author is about 0.8 0.9% so you're gaining 2.5% but you're losing 1 1% and this is without climate actually having kicked in at the moment climate is happening but it hasn't kicked in in a serious way so that's the real issue on the output side on the capital asset side we actually have no idea because in most parts of the world especially in the sort of global south where all this urbanization is happening in its typical kind of informal kind of form we have no idea what those capital assets are like so we can't even estimate what the losses are like but the fact that's important to look at here is your capital assets are about five and a half times there's a leverage about five and a half times between your output on that side it's growing a little bit slower than than the output side one of the core questions we have to ask ourselves as far as water sanitation all of this blue green gray infrastructure is concerned is how much impact is working on this place so this is a big unanswered question if we could do it at you know neighborhood city and other level we really need research that speaks to this question because we know we have no idea how to scale that 
because this has a multiplier impact on the economy. If you knock out something on the capital side, it has a dramatic impact on output, on employment, and a whole range of other things. So this is one thing that we need to focus on because you know the financing, et cetera, is, is downstream of this process as far as that's concerned. So that's the big global context. I'm going to be speaking uh, based on these half a dozen reports. This is a summary for urban policymakers that we launched at COP27 uh, in 2022. That's the whole sort of IPCC panel that did this. We basically took a lot of science, 11,000 pages, seven years of work, and basically boiled it down into 100 pages so that people could actually read it. So it's available, we're happy to, you know, it's on the net, et cetera, et cetera. This deals with the science and connects it to a whole range of issues. However, having said that, if you look for water and sanitation in that space, in spite of the fact that I sort of co-led the process, I've been working in this, in this space for a while, there is not much mention of it, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Three other reports. One is the Global Commission, which I am uh, a member of, which was kind of very influential in the 2030 uh, Water Conference, uh, the report of that. A very important report produced by the Dutch Environmental uh, Assessment Agency, PBL, uh, which I would really encourage you to look at. It's one of the best pieces of work looking globally at water, and of course at WASH, but primarily at water. And finally, another commission that I was part of uh, from the London School of Hygiene, which produced uh, the Lancet report on uh, cl on, on, on climate and health. So I'm, this is the references, you'll see the references in all of the slides. So, you know, those of you who are academics, researchers, et cetera, you'll be able to drill down and look at the underlying stuff that's there. So what is the nexus that we're talking about here? This is, I guess, the big hypothesis, fine? When we negotiated the SDGs, uh, it, you know, it is important and, and critical, being, building on the MDGs, that we got SDG 6 on clean water and sanitation. Much of what we're talking about is the relationship between 6 and 13. The dark blues here are really the, 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 the goals and targets that strongly relate to water. The light blues have some relationship. For example, there is a relationship between inequality and having poor water and sanitation, but it's less strong as, you know, other kind of things like uh, sustainable cities and communities. So I guess the critical thing is this, and this is where we're trying to rework the narrative. See, it took us 47 years to go from the first UN conference on water in 1977 to, to, to 2023. And, you know, just to be very frank about it, there's a reason for that to happen. It's not that it's happened by accident. It's happened because the international community uh, and many, many countries do not prioritize, even though they know it's so critical, water as a sector and water and sanitation as a critical subsector. I mean, it, it, it wouldn't take you 47 years for that to happen unless it's so. There's a lot of uh, differing opinions, conflicts, etc., in the sector, which have not allowed us to consolidate. That's why, even though you may work, work, work in WASH, it's important to connect to the larger processes happening in water, because there is a connection between what's happening with water in agriculture and what water is happening in cities. We do need to look at that connection, and if you're not able to build that consolidated kind of voice, there's not going to be much action. So it's great to work effectively, like we've done very well in this country and many other countries, you know, in Africa, Latin America, et cetera, on WASH. But if you don't put it into a larger context, it doesn't matter, fine, because the system doesn't move, and the system is very large, has a lot of mobility in it. So obvious thing. Fresh water is an extremely scarce resource. This is a global pattern. Those of us who teach us know that quite, quite, quite clearly. Huh? There's two and a half percent. But remember, there are two types, that, there are many colors of water, but there are two types that matter. There's blue water, the stuff that we use a lot, which comes to the taps and wells, in hand pumps, et cetera, et cetera, and we use a lot for our wash activity. But there's also another kind of water which you call green water. That green water is very important. It's in the soil. It's in the biomass that say, if you don't have green water, you don't have food. Okay, so if you don't have food, then you can't use the toilet. And these two things are connected, and especially as we're reaching the limits on the use of, bl of blue water, green water is becoming very critical. This we all know, I'm just putting it up here for, for, for context. This is the projection of where we will be on SDG 6. This is a UN document that came out last year from UN DESA of the numbers of people. This is on a base of eight and a half billion people, that's it. It's pretty bad, and much, much of what we're going to be seeing is in the geographies that many of us are working. But I'll stop and, and, and hold on this slide, because this slide is very important. What it does is it looks at key risks. The, the most established risk is of inadequate water and sanitation. You know, this has been going on for 150 years. You know, many people here and, and their, you know, their advisors have built their careers on this. So it's sanitation, drought, flooding, storms, and wildfires. These are the things that interact with climate, fine? The size of the circle gives you a sense of, you know, where we are at the medium value, which is at the current point of time, and then where you're going to go out in time. So the thing about water and sanitation is the number of people affected is a huge area of debate, and we don't actually have data on this. 
Uh, it's anybody's guess, and there's a huge literature on this question about how big or large it is. The challenge when you start talking to economists and people who sit behind them who finance this, if you don't have an idea of the people affected and the people who are killed, you can't make a good assessment of dailies, and if you can't make a good assessment of dailies and the health benefits, it becomes complex to deal with. And on the economic damage side, we actually have very, this is, this is a global study, fine, and PBL is pretty rigorous in what they're doing. So they, the first thing that I'm saying is we have a problem here of data. Some countries do it better, some locations do it better, at, but at the global scale, we are not able to make the, the case accepting in a common sense kind of way. Obviously, water is important. Sanitation is important. It has an Im impact on health, especially for particular populations who are most vulnerable. But for the other things that you can see, there is much better data. Hence, the kind of actions that you see become much more concrete, whether it's drought or flooding, which is a big thing as far as climate is concerned, uh, and sort of storms. So you have much better estimates as far as the data is concerned, even for wildfires. Of course, many of these wildfires are in places which have high income values, no? so in California and, and Australia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the thing that I think is, that we have to sort of grapple with unless we're able to fill in some of these things in the dominant narrative of economic development, of financing, et cetera, we're not going to get much purchase. So forget about climate financing. Just financing itself, uh, those of us who managed environmental master plans for city knows, you know, know how we kind of manage things so that your cost benefit is good because you overestimate the health benefits. I mean, you know, that's, that's a kind of a story that we don't like telling, but that's a true story that's there. You have to do the same thing as far as uh, the world is concerned, otherwise you're not going to get attention uh, from, you know, financing agencies. The other thing, of course, is this is a rank ordering of climate-related risks, and I've highlighted the three that are most important as far as water and sanitation are concerned, but there are also a lot of others. And the others, in some senses, are taking a lot of the attention that might possibly come into the space if we have the evidence and are able to tell the story very clearly. For example, groundwater abstraction, South Asia is horrible as far as, far as groundwater abstraction is concerned. You can see it from the satellites, you can see what, you know, we get, we get a gravity anomaly as far as that's concerned. Food security is a very critical issue. Uh, in, in India. It may be a more serious issue in some parts of India than maybe even diarrhea death, okay? And it's going to become worse. So what I'm saying is there's a competing agenda across a whole range of other things, including things that we don't necessarily talk about. Nutrient emissions from households and industries, this means basically nitrate and phosphate pollution. So if you come to Bangalore and Bangalore, you know, lakes once in a while catch fire, it's because of that. You know, you, ha you have a whole range of things that come from untreated sewage, plus a whole range of other uh, industrial products that are part of the cycle. So these are a whole range of things that add up uh, to the, you know, to the core challenge of, of, of climate and climate related processes. This is a paper which, which I mean, this is a, the Lancet Commission report. We spent two years looking for this. We had some of the best researchers in the world, a really well, uh, you know, led team. Andy Haynes, who used to be the director of, of, of the London School, and I were on, on the commission. This is a mapping of all the global literature which connects health with climate. And if you look at this, the only potential places where WASH appears in second order. And this is a map, it's a very, very systematic map of maybe 300 different articles, systematic reviews, et cetera, where WASH comes up is maybe in, you know, methane emissions, Barbara's here, so, you know, that kind of stuff that's important, and maybe in urban green infrastructure. So most of the scientific literature, and this is, like I said, the best studies across the world, includes China, et cetera, et cetera, does not talk about pathways that deal with emissions as far as that's concerned. So if the literature is not saying that, and you're in the middle of a negotiating a negotiation with multiple countries, including some that are meant to fund this, they will obviously not be able to make the connection because we know it, but it's not there. Fine? So, you know, I'm being, like I said, I'm going to be rude today, but that's what the evidence looks at. You're looking at a whole range of other things of which, you know, ambient air quality, which is no, knowing that no, no is very important, public transport, et cetera, et cetera, low emission fuels, uh, indoor air pollution, which is a big issue in, in cities, including this city and other places, et cetera. It's not there. This is a full sort of pathways linkage, and it becomes even worse when you look at the full, and this is a very rigorously done process, it looks at all the drivers on this side. Uh, so it goes from you know, buildings to transportation. These are the end users in some senses. Uh, diet is very important. Thankfully, this has happened for the first time. The first was systematic kind of review, review, which looks at the impact of di di diet on, uh, on health. And if you look at the pathways that are there, we are kind of absent in the room, okay? Partially because the research is not there, and partially, and this is the big question, is it because there is no impact and there is no pathway? Or is it because the research is not there? 
Fine? That's, 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 that's the harsh question that we have to arrive. So you can see what the numbers are like. This is what I was saying. You've got mortality at 222. You've got years of uh, life loss, and of course, you have the dailies after that. If you're not able to compile this region by region, or hopefully city by city at some point of time, it becomes very difficult then to lay this out because, you know, the economists, the finances know this exists. And they'll ask you, if I'm going to do this with a life table, I need to know what's happening. And if you're going to answer the question, then you're waving your hands. And there are lots of other people standing on the table and waving their hands, you know, even, even more wildly than you are. So this is the good and the bad news in some senses. The methods exist, the information, the data, and in some cases, the evidence don't, don't exist. So that's, you know, I thought I'd start with the sobering part that's there. So the thing about the climate story is, the climate story is currently told as if temperature was the only thing in the world. Fine, we all, all talk about 1.5. I'm sort of guilty of having co-led that report. So this is a story as far as that's concerned, and I'll tell it in a very blunt way. We've been saying this for a long time. Like I said, I helped write the 1.5 report, which is a long, maybe you know, six, seven years, eight years ago. Um, the story at the, mo the moment is we are in the middle of a 1.5 overshoot. Much of the negotiation that's happening is to try and stay below 1.5. The fact is, and we've known that even during COVID when there was a little bit of recession, is that we are going to overtake 1.5 very quickly. And the message that we had from the IPCC at that time was very clear. We're at 1.1, but every 0.1 degree makes a difference. That's why doing something on emissions reduction in your toilets and your STPs is important because everything makes a difference. Because it's highly nonlinear at every one degree. 1.5 is an unacceptable level of impact as far as Millions of people are concerned. So, you know, at 1.5, you'll have 500 million people who will be impacted, for example, uh, in terms of food, food insecurity, fine? The fact is, we are in the middle of a 1.5 overshoot. We're trying to implement the SDGs that have been going backwards in the middle of that, of, of that transition. But the really horrible story is not that. The horrible story is the countries have been negotiating, and I was part of that initial framing process. We've been negotiating the Paris Climate Agreement. The Paris Climate Agreement is not about 1.5. The Paris Climate Agreement has been negotiated between 2.7 and 3.2 degrees. That's what, the, that's what the negotiation is about. It's not about 1.5, excepting for you know, LDCs and other countries. We're negotiating for pathways to 2.7 and 3.2. That's what we are negotiating on. So that's a completely unthinkable world. We're in the Anthropocene. But most of our ecological systems, most of our agriculture will be gone as we know it at 2 degrees. So you know, it, this is a very, very sobering story. And the science in this is it's pretty decent and whatever. This is the, the mapping. And again, 1.5, remember, is 1.5 uh, global air surface temperature at the equator. So as you can see here, this is the projections that are there. At the higher latitudes, and even in places like the high Himalayas, the temperatures are higher. Right? That, that's the nature of the physics in some senses. So there are many places that are way, well below, below 1.5. And the places that are most, and this comes from our report, that's there. This is a mapping of cities over almost a 60-year period that's there. And you can look at the spot, uh, you know, the temperatures are there. Kolkata is at 2.6 elevation. This is 2017-18, if I remember correctly, because, you know, we did this assessment. So you can see that cities are already well above that. And this is without urban Thailand, fine. This is the background stuff that's coming from warming as far as that's concerned. This is in the IPCC report. The reference is there. It's volume. Uh, one, if you want the page number, I can give it to you later. So cities basically have emerged as critical climate hotspots, and they will become bigger. You see two circles here. One is the current population. This is half a million cities and above, taking the UN-based base data. And that's where they're going to be growing. So if you look at many parts of Africa, you certainly look at South Asia, because that's, we are the next big wave of urbanization. Africa's next, and you look at Nigeria, for example, and you can see that. Uh, Latin America and the rest of the world are kind of stable as far as that's concerned. That's the next big wave. That's why this is so important in some senses, right? Because this is a hot spot in some ways. I'll just show you two slides. This is 2020, and people in Ahmedabad, we were just saying it's warm here, and I'm saying, oh, this is just cool weather for, for Ahmedabad at the moment. Um, so that's the 2020, 29 degree mean average, fine. Ahmedabad's not here. And of course, if you have urban heat island, then it even becomes more exciting and interesting. I was giving you just background temperatures. So the thing is, much of the climate story is told around temperature. And you know, the way some of us tell, it, tell the story in slightly different ways. If somebody from the global south had discovered climate change, we would use water as indicator and not temperature. Because that is our lived reality at the moment, fine? So for this, their answers. They're very good answers, and I flipped through them very, very quickly. You know, cities are the places where this is happening. The critical question for us is a coupling of three different systems. Because we didn't have so many people in the past, they were not so tightly coupled. The coupling between the climate system, which is the atmosphere, human systems and everything we do, and the ecosystems. They talk to each other. 
because one third or more of the emissions are coming from what happens on land use and land cover. It comes from agriculture, forests. So you can't only fix your cities, you've got to fix where the consumption comes from. You've got to deal with that back and forth linkages. You've got to look at the entire uh, settlement system. You can't only look at big places as far as it's concerned. These are all the nasty things that happen. And all of them are happening in all systems now. We have very clear evidence across the world. There's no place in the world in which this is not happening. In some places, the signals are stronger. In some places, they're weaker. Fine. So the answer to this, the fancy answer that we invented and the countries have kind of bought, is something called climate resilient development. Okay? It's kind of a weird thing, but it basically does three things. It basically takes the sustainable development stuff, which we know is not doing well. It adds adaptation to that, which was not earlier there. It brings in mitigation because the best way to adapt is to mitigate so you don't have to adapt. And then finally, because we have the CRD uh, process, as you have biodiversity inside it. Because if your ecological systems collapse, the whole story kind of falls apart in some senses. Huh? And that's what two degrees and above, or even before that, for some systems make a difference. So what does it work like? The, the, the good news story is, at the global scale, and in, in many regions, we know what the answers are like. We know what the options are like. The question is, how do you bring them together? How do you make them work? How do you implement them? How are they feasible? How can they be financed? All the other governance systems. So basically, the, the story on this is very simple. There are five things that need to get done. The energy one is obvious, and we're doing that. India's one of the leaders in that process. You've got, to, you've got to change industrial systems. Why? Because your brick, cement, concrete, glass, all come from the industrial systems. They are locked in. They're very, very difficult to change. And they're doing very badly in terms of the transition at the moment. You have to look at land, oceans, and freshwater systems, because that's where water and your life is coming from in some senses. And you've got to look at the, the relationship with that. But the pivotal one, and that's why we are starting to work in the IPCC on the special report on, on cities starting uh, in April, is the urban and the infrastructure systems. If you get that right in most places, you can turn around stuff, partially because much of it is not built. The second thing is there's an incentive to make it and work it and, and do it both. But finally, the lesson that we, saw, we learned from COVID, you have to change lifestyles. You have to change behavior, because if that doesn't change, and everybody in India wants to become like they are in North America, it's done for. It's done for even, even before you know, we get forth of the way. The real message on this from the modeling and the analysis is you cannot trade off. There was a discussion today about trade offs. You cannot anymore trade off one against the other. You can't say, I'm going to do energy systems and forget about the urban. You've got to do all of them together. 30 years ago, when we started the negotiations, 32 uh, in, in Rio, we could have done them separately. We cannot do it anymore. That's why this is a systemic problem, which means that you have to have systemic responses. Yeah, so for all the planners that are there, you've got lifetime of employment here. You know? This is like an endless challenge that will not end just now. So they have to happen together. And the good news is that we know what the options are like. I'm just going to run through this very, very quickly. So, you know, if you're looking at mitigation, you have energy, urban. There are about, we, we spent, you know, two and a half years reviewing them, about 50 different options. We know how feasible they are. We know how they map on the, to the sustainable development goals. This has all been analyzed with, you know, there are 1,700 references behind it. So you can go down sector by sector and look at the options at work. Uh, this assessment has been done for Africa very well, Latin America, Europe. It hasn't been done for Asia because they couldn't mix up Afghanistan, China, and India. The, the metrics didn't work. You know, this, this spreads. So the method works. We have the answers as far as that's concerned. And as far as uh, adaptation, which is a lot of what we're doing on the, on the war sector is concerned, we have fairly clearly idea of where the risks are. The health one is the most important one that's there. And what the options are, how feasible they are and how, how, many, how much of co-benefits. We had this discussion today about co-benefits, right? What are the co-benefits between potential feasibility and mitigation? And you can see the size of the uh, dots gives you a sense of what's happening. So this is all, I mean, it's pretty well established. Not only established, it's been signed off by many countries. So basically, the fancy word for it is climate resilient development. Actually, it means doing development properly uh, and being sensible about some of these things and not using too much material throughput and lots of energy to make it happen. So that's the normal story. So we say, OK, we've got an answer to the climate story. But there's another thing that's happening at the same time, and that is we're in the middle of a very serious global water crisis. Now, we know they're local water crisis. They've been there forever. Uh, from Marappa onwards, we've been having water crisis. But this is a more serious question that's there. So what's the evidence on that? This is a global drought, drought, drought index from 2010. You see lots of the world is in red. Fine. So you're doing wash in the context of something that's happening somewhere else. This is, of course, drought affected people. And you can see the big hotspots across the world as far as it's concerned. But the thing, of course, about water is usually what happens, and it's kind of, you know, it's contrarian. The places that have drought also have flooding at the same time because it's the same distribution but becoming more intense and more frequent, right? So you have the same places. Gujarat is also classic in that, in that way. You have flash flooding and you have drought pretty much in the same year as far as that's concerned. And a lot of the drought risk and the flood risk is accentuated in particular areas, along coasts, along rivers, 
uh, and where the most significant populations are. This you all know, but I'm just, I just put it up here to give, give, give you a sense of the impact of unsafe water versus natural disasters. See, look at what you see in the newspapers. Most of the stuff that's coming out these days is about 75, about conflicts, fine? Sometimes when the conflicts are not so active, it's natural disasters. But this thing is happening quietly in the background, and we are not able to tell the story as everybody else is, fine? So it's not in people's consciousness. Um, it's not in the consciousness, it's not in their metrics, then we have a real problem here. So, you know, the evidence is telling us where to go. The really bad story, and this is from, again, the uh, 2022 IPCC report, is the, the bottom map is the proportion of species that are expected to die. Uh, and this is the, dr the dark red on the top is 75 to 100% species loss. Huh? Meaning, you know, if you lose a keystone species, you're in trouble, of course. But that's 75 to 100% species loss. You can see as you go from 1.5 to 2C to 3C to 4C how bad it gets. We're negotiating around 3C. This is the really frightening story as far as that's concerned. Because if you don't have life, you know, you can forget about the wars and the conflicts and all the other stuff that's there. This is very clearly established. And we have to make that connection in some ways. So there is a story about water that we're not telling, which is parallel to the story of, of climate. And I think that's important to try and rebuild uh, our ideas around. So how do you bring the two things together? The first thing, of course, is the thing about water, it's complicated. So if you, look at, if you look at parts of Africa and South Asia, actually we're going to have more water. Yeah? Because it's very simple. The oceans heat up, there's more water vapor in the atmosphere, and then you have more rain. Fine? The challenge, of course, is that the patterns of rainfall are going to change very dramatically. So the patterns of precipitation, are the basis on which the Holocene, 10,000 years of agriculture, civilization was based on, are going to change very dramatically. In some cases, it may be more. In some cases, it may be less, as far as that's concerned. Also, we know pretty well now from the science what the probability of severe or not so severe impacts are going to be. So you can see, you know, heat waves are going to be probably a lot worse. And we don't talk about ocean heat waves, but if you are into eating fish, you'll know pretty soon what that means. Okay, so we know the science is pretty good, and now with supercomputers, all this AI stuff, we're becoming better and better as far as I'm concerned. But the real story is here. This is a paper that we produced last year. The basic story is, for, for many things, like the ozone hole and carbon, we know that uh, uh, greenhouse gases, we know that we have exceeded planetary boundaries. For the first time, there was a science article that's produced by a friend uh, a year back. We have exceeded the blue water boundary. That's pretty clear. That's at the bottom here. So you can see here when we exceeded the blue water boundary, you know, some, somewhere in the, in, in the early 2000s, and it's getting really bad as far as that's concerned. This is the exceedance number. But the really tricky thing is we, are, we have just crossed the green water boundary as far as that's concerned. That's a very serious problem. Basically, what it means is the global hydrological cycle has now been destabilized. It's not your local water cycle. It isn't local drought and your groundwater table going down and you know, your dug wells drying up and all that kind of stuff and having to, women having to work whatever, 10 hours to get water, etc. The global hydrological cycle is changing. The rainfall patterns are going to change. And this is an absolutely existential crisis. This is the proof that we're actually in the Anthropocene. And you know, the numbers are getting better and better. There'll be a new set of papers that will come out in science in the next few days. I'll stop on this. This is an important graph just now. I'm going to maybe a little run over time. This is a projection. These are all model-based projections of what the global land use would be like, business as usual, huh, in 2070. This is important because when we think of wash, we don't think about land and we don't necessarily think about people because it's all in, always in a context, right? So I look at it there. This is what the projection is. 48% of the world's land mass is going to be used for agriculture, right? And only 28% for forests. This is like, you know, the biodiversity convention we said was 33. No. 30, well, 30 by 30 or whatever, slightly above that. So we're using that amount of land for agriculture because you've got to feed so many people. Yeah? And you know, urban land is about 0.9%. But the interesting thing is not that. If you look at the type of land use, that's where you look at the difference that's there. That's a breakup of 9.6 billion people, rural and urban, in three different locations. In river basins, where a lot of us like to live, the Indo-Kinetic Basin is one, but the bulk of the people in the world are living in dry lands. And then, of course, deltas and coasts are also at high risk because of storms, and eventually, by the end of the century, state sea level rise. So you can look, if you look at the hatch portion, that's a, the hatch portion is the urban populations in those locations. So what I'm saying is when we plan, that's obvious for planning, but even when we look at planning of infrastructure and wash, when we're building a trunk line that may last for 50 years, it has to be in this context. We know that the infrastructure is going to be different based on the context, but we now know the hydrological frame is actually going to work. Okay, thanks. I'm going to run through very quickly. I'm going to skip a lot of these slides. Uh, I'll jump through very quickly. This is a question that, that's also important to us. This is a big issue here. Nitrogen release, I haven't put up phosphorus numbers as far as it's concerned. 
This is the biodiversity loss maps for over the next 20 years where you're going to see the biodiversity loss as far as it's concerned. So the question there is, how do you start looking at this? How do you start looking at the WSS space? We know what the options are like. There's a lot of rhetoric about green-blue infrastructure. Green-blue is good. By and large, it doesn't work from our own experience unless you have gray. Today, we have technology, so you need to put digital stuff inside that makes it better. You basically need hybrid solutions across the places. Again, in an IPCC report, 2020, that's there. We know what the options are like. They've been assessed. So these are, as far as water is concerned, this is from the water chapter. Um, this is chapter four in the uh, main assessment report here. You can see, I think, there are about 27, 30 odd different options that are there. We know what's going to happen in 1.5, 2, 3, and 4. Okay? The only point that I want to make is urban water is a very small part of the story. Second order, I've just you know, uh, highlighted on a dotted line flood risk reduction. So we know what the effectiveness of these, 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 these options are like. We also know what the residual impact is like. Okay? So what I'm saying is we have to bring these two agendas together and then situate the story as far as uh, climate is concerned. Um, so anyway, this, is, this, was a, this was an animation. But very quickly, I presented this to the General Assembly last year. And we said, look, if you want to address the global water agenda, you need to do eight big things. Right? The most critical one is food, because that's where we're all in deep trouble. The second one is what we call the health system transition, of which WASH, you can see SDG 6, is very critical. Right? So this is part of the pitch of saying you've got to bring this together. You've got to do cities, and cities and WASH are closely tied to that. You've also got to do livelihoods, because you know, that most of our livelihoods, especially in the water-related sectors, are going to be at considerable risk. You've got to deal with, with land use, you've got to deal bio, bio, with biodiversity, you've obviously got to do with water quality, which we often forget about. And finally, the question is about, the core question is inequality. Yeah? So you have to have, for our sector, and this is just one way of representing it, a way of being able to situate where you are and what you need to do. And of course, we all know that all the stuff at the bottom is the most critical things. All of these things are very nice, but if you don't have the governance, the regulation, the finance, etc., this is never going to happen as far as that's concerned. So I will, I kind of, so I'm going to skip a lot of stuff here. I was going to take two cases. I'm going to skip through 20 slides very quickly of this large program that my, my colleagues have been running. Uh, in Tamil Nadu, which is touching 16 million people, it's brought, brought in 500 crores, et cetera, and focus very quickly on two slides. So we're running this large program. Most of you know about it. Many of us have done similar things in other states there. It's currently touching 16 million people. It'll touch 30 in time. You know, it's doing various things. It's basically helped transform a state. But in that context, how do you look at climate questions? And I'll try and sort of break them up into four buckets very quickly. The first thing is, and we struggle with this, my colleagues are here, and I'm always at their neck. I'm saying, if you cannot quantify the health benefits, you know, you could have spent as much money as you can. You spent, you know, five years or seven years doing this thing. You can't actually get attention. The health benefits have to be quantified. If you don't do that, that's your primary variable. The second thing that's pretty obvious is you have to get a handle on water efficiency, because if you don't have the water, water carriage systems don't work. In fact, the beauty in, in Tamil Nadu, because we know how bad the water situation is going to be like, is... You know, FSM is a great technology, not only because, you know, it does work, because it's going to use a lot less water. So when you're in 2050 and you have a serious drought, then it'll be a system that will actually work rather than other systems that may not work. The other thing which, you know, some of us are working on the edge of just now is how do you reduce emissions, right? And, I mean, my guess on this, and I'm not sure about this as yet, is that the emission intensity, especially if you do not take the... the, the uh, the uh, embodied energy is there, is not high enough in the water sector to actually get serious attention for both policymakers and finances. It'll be quite, I mean, this is a useful, you know, I'm sure we'll have a discussion with this in Barbara. Looking at the larger numbers, I would say it's important, everything is important, but this is not so important that you're going to get attention. So maybe we should not spend, I mean, some researchers should obviously be working on that, but you don't want the whole sector focusing on that to draw in climate finance because it will not be viable. Again, I'm happy to be wrong here, but that's what the numbers seem to suggest. The big story is going to be on infrastructure resilience. Because we know all the n nasty things are going to happen, right? So how you don't deal with extreme drought, how you're going to deal with storm surge and flooding in particular areas. And then, in some places, we're going to have to move cities back. They're going to move. The planning framework has to change. Because imagine trying to move Mumbai back 10 kilometers because the sea levels are rising, right? I mean, that's, that's a big, big challenge, a new form of planning in some senses. So we have to think of these questions, and you know, then I've, I'm going to skip a lot of things. We do a lot of this technical work here. There's a lot of detailed stuff. I'm not going to go into the weeds here. I'll just close with this, this last set of slides. So you know, some provocative ideas here. The first one is, at least my contention is, WASH has to be embedded in the local water cycle, in everything we talked about. For example, we do not talk about biodiversity and the linkage with water. 
I mean, non -agric agricultural water, for example. So embodiment in the local water cycle, which means looking at in the landscape, waterscape is very important. And in the larger story, we have to connect it with what I was trying to do just now, with water, climate, nutrition, uh, and biodiversity. Because if you don't, you will not get attention, right? The implication for that operationally is planning has to change, because all of this stuff has got to do with planning, right? And of course, obviously, development will change if planning changes. The second thing is that there are severe gaps in the WASH climate evidence chain and narrative, as I understand it. And I've shown you the evidence. Again, I'm very happy to be wrong. And we will immediately sort of you know, expand and amplify this across the world through the commission that's there. The first thing, of course, health impacts. Second thing, I'm not a fan of cost benefit. But if you don't start with cost benefit, people will leave the room. You have to go to multidimensional uh, you know, viability which involves many other factors that are there, it's difficult to do. Operationally, it takes years to that, do that kind of stuff. That's where we want to go, but if you don't get cost benefit into the story, you've lost your crowd in the first place. Second thing is, like I said earlier, mitigation, the, the, you know, basically of the CO2 and CH4, the em methane emissions, my sense is this sector is not, it's complicated, you know, the fugitive emissions, et cetera, et cetera. There's not much we can do in that. There, there is no discussion at the moment on embodied energy and the opportunity for scope three. Okay, a lot of the stuff about carbon storage is either growing trees, putting stuff under the ground, or capturing it from the air. Actually, urban systems have the potential, even in concrete, even in concrete, even though you may not like it, to actually capture carbon. Fine. And then there's nothing happening, loss and, no loss on damage. I would imagine the real story that we have is about vulnerability reduction. It's concrete, and I'll, I'll close in a few seconds. But operationally for us, the really big story that is under-researched is the story of culture, Fine. It's a call, the question of, you know, of, of, of caste and, and gender dynamics as far as this country is concerned. Because that's what drives everything else, fine? At least in this part of the world. I'm, I'm sure other people from other parts of the world may do so. So how does one do that? You need to operation, operationalize climate resilience and wash systems. The drought resilience is pretty obvious. There's a big debate about separage versus sewerage. We know, know about that. Flood resilience I've just touched on. Uh, storm resilience again, depending on coastal areas or otherwise. This is all sort of planning related and looking at infrastructure. And then, you know, this is a very, it's an experimental area. We work on this a lot also. How nature-based solutions really have to be grounded in reality. And they don't, they don't work everywhere. They don't work for everything. And you have to look at them in a changing context of land use, competing things for people, agriculture, forestry, carbon, this, that, the other. It's, it's not a magic solution. This is the reason why there was so much pushback on, on NBS in the negotiations. And I was at the front end of that process there. And finally, this is a hard question. But there is an opportunity in many parts of the world to reimagine rural urban linkages. It's kind of very simple. You know, you're drawing water from hundreds of kilometers away to bring it into the city. Then you're creating a huge amount of wastewater, which you're making a mess of. You know, it's either polluting the groundwater or doing whatever it is, and you don't treat it. There's a huge opportunity to use it for industry. We heard about that from Mr. Lalbai this morning. That's kind of obvious. The question is, can you retrofit your cities quickly enough to do dual piping so you can bring it back for flushing, do two times round, and you can use it there? Or can you use it for agriculture? In any case, at least in my parts of the world, a lot of the agriculture is done in sewage in any case, fine. If you do it in a more organized way, it might actually work. That's one story. The second thing is, with that food, with that water, is a tremendous amount of nutrients. Huh? You can put it into the fancy toilet and turn it into ash. But it might be better that you take it out and bring it back like Chinese agriculture has done for, you know, whatever, 1,500 years or so, and bring it back into re regenerative agriculture. Because all our experience, and there are lots of people here who have a lot of, uh, you know, better experience than I have, is, if you're able to bring back soil health and, and you know, water into urban landscapes, biodiversity bounce back is unbelievable in some ways. You know? we, we can do a lot as far as that's concerned. So the recycling and reuse of blue, blue, uh, of blue water, and of course moving that towards green water is a new unexplored frontier. Obviously the amount of water that we use for water and sanitation is very small. But it's tied to other things because the infrastructures are linked. I'm not saying that we have to have combined sewers and combined systems at all. So we need to think about that. And finally, there's a lot of nutrients out there that can be brought, brought back. So I think you know, when we're talking about circular economy, all these nice things, these are good things that are there. But we effectively have to think differently about how these flows are. If you think differently, you'll reorganize how your land use is done, how your planning is done, how your economy is structured. And then, of course, if you want that to happen, then you obviously have to change the institutions, the governance, the finance. Uh, and, you know, people have to align themselves to do whatever it is. Sorry, I've run over massively over time, but um, thanks a lot.